All right, so we had started sketching, and we we're sketching off of reference. From our reference folder, which I have nicely organized in my documents under assignment one. So I'm going to want my reference images. In fact, I can even just swoop that out to the desktop because I'll, I'll continue to add to it today and then organize it back later. I'm going to move them over here. So the ones that I marked with green. These are some that I added. I found a new one that I like, which are really cool kind of swamp tree roots. Started looking up roots. This thing, ah, the automatic dating on digital photos. There is no way to get rid of that. You would think it was like post data, but no, it's embedded in the JPEG. So we're gonna have to, it's like a water um, watermark. You're gonna find that. You're gonna find signatures. You're gonna find things you wanna remove from the reference. We're gonna learn how to do that. But I just have a, a righteous anger for that. Because why would anyone want that? I don't want that. It's good stuff. So be mindful if you're taking your photos. Make sure that feature is turned off. It's still in all digital cameras. I found some other roots too that were really cool. Now this, this starts to give me that dystopian feel, right? The color is nice and bright. But these textures and these shapes, this is starting to suggest something a little bit eerier and not, not so pretty. And then nothing, nothing better than a fallen tree right, to show that stuff went wrong and it has been left abandoned. Now, what about when I find roots that are really cool like this? The reason this is an ideal even though it's cool to have a path, and I think, oh, I might have a path. Because we're putting these together into a larger landscape, these trees don't go anywhere, right? So these elements are cut off. And so unless I wanted to leave them cut off in my composition, which really limits how I can show it, like what viewpoint, then they're not very useful. Better to have reference that has the, the roots and the ground, but also has the tops of the trees. You know, this allows me to be a lot more versatile. So that's why I collected more reference that I need, for sure, in order to inform my sketch. Now, another way I can do it, <coughs> I'm doing an image search and I'm doing larger than 10 megapixels. I've only looked at swamp stuff so far. And my brief is a stormy swamp at dusk, dystopian future, the surface is earth, so what about uh, dystopian wreckage? You know, dystopian means that people were there <laughs> and are no longer there. So trash of some sort. I mean, it's too much, it's too much to hope that there's a photograph somewhere of like a sunken dystopian vehicle in a swamp. You know, that's not going to happen. So you get to use your creativity and see what you get. And I need it to be believable. I can't just use like someone's watercolor painting and put it in my photographs and expect it to be believable. And so I might have to get creative with search terms. And remember, I'm limiting them to 10 megapixels or larger. So let's look up debris. Ah, uh, here we go. So little accents. Ah, oh, this is nice. And it might be, yeah, like from hurricane damage. Good stuff. But what's going to say dystopian? Without having to create a 3D model of a futuristic ship and then age it with textures. Because concepts artists. If there's anything concept artists have to do, this is a good example of one, they have to work fast. So this is for Fallout, a concept digital painting. It's light on detail, but it's very suggestive of tone right, and scope. And they start these concept paintings with composites from photos. 
I'm going to use some of the text that we, we're going to do to composite it together, and then they just digitally paint really quickly over the top of it. Because they might get like five hours to do this, to give an idea of, to the director or, or the, the art director of what, what they have in mind. All right, so I'm going to add some dystopian trash. Again, you always want to view the image. And you want to zoom in and make sure it's not totally blurry and terrible. I love this, though. The, the bright red, the accents, and that there's not, it's from a plane crash. Looks like, which is terrible. But now that plane crash can be put to good use. It's also a great reference, you know, short of being sh shot on a green screen, this doesn't have a lot going on in the background, so it'll be easy, easy to isolate out and put into my own landscape. So that's a winner. Let's see what other ones. So I thought this might be interesting if I wanted to hint at a residence somewhere. Yeah, some nice stuff there. Always good to have more than one reference for an idea. And then this, this is nice, but notice the other thing that reference can do is it can limit your camera angle, right? And even though this is great texture, because it's man-made stuff, and this is why man-made stuff is harder to composite than organic stuff, um, if I include this, I know the camera angle. And so my landscape has to match that camera. And if I want my, my sketch to have sky in it, I can't really have a camera angle where I'm looking down at the ground. Does that make sense? Now notice I haven't um, told you anything about lighting, right? Because when we're doing landscape, lighting is generally pretty all over. It's usually outdoor light. But when we do something like creature compositing, we're going to have to pay attention to direction of lighting a lot more. In this, we're just going to kind of create our own lighting across this outdoor reference. But if you're sh finding reference that's super dramatic, like lightning clouds, then lighting might be an issue you have to think about. And then this is just a great little piece of something rusted that might be useful. So I say we need at least five references. I've got a whole lot more. Um, just a quick note when you're doing these things. It's easy to get stuck into traps. So I'm searching and I got 10 megapixels or bigger. And this is Puerto Rico after the hurricane. You know, this might be a good thing to have in a swamp, this downed highway sign. So I find it, it looks great, but I have to look at it to see if it's in focus. They took this while driving. So the background's very blurry, but if I'm only interested in this, then that might be okay. But this is what I wanted to point out. On this screen, it will give you similar images. And this can be really tempting, and you go, oh man, that's amazing. That would be great to use. But the problem is these related images are not limited to 10 megapixels or larger. So it's easy to go down those rabbit holes, but if you find one that you really like, then what you do is you search by image. And then you say all sizes. And then you'll find the largest version of it. And this largest version is still not large enough to use in any big way in my composition. So that 10 megapixel is, is important. Yeah, the actual definition of 10 megapixels is 3,648 pixels by 2,736, 10 megapixels or larger, right? Now look, you can search for 40 megapixels or larger, but you're not gonna find much on that. Cause that's like NASA imagery. By the way, if you do NASA and you search for, we'll talk about this more when we talk about copyright and we search for 10 megapixels or larger, you're gonna find a lot, especially if you look for Hubble, images. And the beauty of it is NASA is a federal program. It's funded with federal tax money. 
it's owned by us. So any image that NASA produces or any federal agency produces is public domain. So we are free to use it for any purpose we want, even if it's recognized. So this is kind of great if you're doing space stuff, right? Not a lot of us can take photos in space, but luckily we have our tax money, money doing that for us. And so designers use this a lot. You may have noticed that. <laughs> And you guys can sell your own Hubble Space Telescope calendars anytime you want, right? And never worry about getting sued because it's public domain. Of course, everyone can do that. So we'll talk about the, the glory of public domain. Now, this is pretty cool. This is a wallpaper. Someone's trying to sell a wallpaper of it, right? And I'm not doing something in outer space, but this might be an interesting texture that I can use, you know, in my dystopian swamp. Like maybe there's a virus in the air that really distorts the sky, makes things look weird. So I'm not going to use this fully opaque, but this might be what we call a texture overlay over the scene. And we'll get to that probably beginning of next class. All right. And the last thing I need, how do I show that it's on Earth? and not some alien planet. Well, I'm not doing crazy vegetation or anything, but if I'm gonna show the sky, I probably wanna show something of Earth, right? So our moon, which is very recognizable. And tonight is a super moon, which is when the moon is 30% closer to the Earth and it's full. And I think there's a partial lunar eclipse. So there's a lot going on tonight. So it would look something like this. So that looks kind of otherworldly, but it's still Earth. I don't think I want to go for the eclipse, but for a swamp, I think I want something like this. Because my, my brief is that it's at dusk. And so what I love about this moon imagery is it could also be a sun. And it's bizarre looking. And even though I'm not going to use the modern buildings, that sky, I can use that. Okay, so now I've got reference. I'm gonna minimize Google. I'm gonna try to bring as much of that reference onto the screen as I can, and I do that with my view options within the, the finder window. Okay, that's good. And now I can finish this up. So I have one, two, three, Kind of references here. I know I'm going to want the moon. The super moon. So I'll mark that. <coughs> I really like the color tags in on Max because then you can organize them by your tags. So these are the ones I definitely want to use. And then I want to find some debris as well and figure out how that's going to help my composition. It's also helpful to think in terms of foreground, middle ground, and background. So this is a great foreground object. We'll call it foreground wreckage. A way you can label. So when you need to rename on a Mac, you can double click slowly on the title, but sometimes that's tricky. So an easier way is just to click on it once and then hit return and you'll get to the title again. So foreground wreckage, very good. I'm gonna put that into my portrait format sketch here. It's also easy to isolate. But because it's cropped at the bottom, that really could only be foreground if I want to use it. I think that's number five. My super moon is number four of my references. My storm sky is number three, my tree group number one.